Thank you, Nadira, and thanks to the organizers and Scleroderma Foundation, the sponsors, and to all of you. Um, uh, it's been a couple of years since I've, uh, maybe more than that, since I've talked to the, or had a chance to talk to the Scleroderma Foundation and Scleroderma patients. Uh, and I've always been impressed that how enthusiastic and in, uh, involved the uh, patients are, what great questions they have, and, uh, uh, and I think that goes a long way to uh, make, uh, to advance the progress in the disease. Um, let's see, I'm just going to go there. Okay, so I have uh, no conflicts of interest. The talk is about interstitial lung diseases, and I use the plura, plural here, and then I've, uh, so that's about half, and then what's new in these diseases? Um, why lung disease? Um, because as Roberto has, has, has already told you, that lung disease is the leading cause of death in scleroderma, even if people don't have lung disease or don't have any symptoms, they'll often uh, ask, why are you sending me for these tests and why are you sending me to a pulmonologist? I feel fine. Uh, but the, the thing is that we take lung disease very seriously. Uh, and, and Roberto showed you the slide. If you look carefully or if you remember the slide, the interstitial disease on the mortality was slightly greater than the uh, pulmonary uh, hypertension, but both were important. Uh, my al also, I'm going to talk about that it really isn't one disease, but it's many. And in particular, I'm going to ask, so the first time I started seeing patients, somebody said scleroderma lung, and I said, oh, what's that? And then sort of we, you learn scleroderma lung is a disease of patients with scleroderma, it's sort of in medical school or, or wherever, but what I'm saying is it's really not, uh, really not one disease, but it's multiple diseases. And uh, Roberto's already talked about pulmonary hypertension. Uh, there are some other vascular diseases that have been covered in this. Um, interstitial fibrosis is a disease that I'm going to talk essentially about uh, several of these. Um, one of the uh, diseases that uh, is uh, called organizing pneumonia, or what I call alveolar ductitis, it's these the alveoli are the air exchanging areas and just before you get to those is the alveolar duct. These fill up with a, uh, a collagen or a scarring tissue. Uh, uh, I, I have a, a slide on that a little bit later. There is quiescent scarring, somebody who's had a lung disease for many years or maybe not and you'll see scarring on the radiograph uh, at an uh, autopsy. Those, those scars are uh, not the kind of interstitial fibrosis, but uh, not a, 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 an important one. Aspiration, Roberto has already mentioned. Um, Drug-induced lung diseases are another possibility. There are a couple of, um, of uh, uh, medications that we use that can actually cause uh, uh, interstitial lung disease. Neoplasm is another uh, concern. Um, the, uh, the chance of cancer is increased, about uh, 8.6 uh, is the rate per 1,000 per people, which is quite high. That's about 16 times normal. Uh, and that's increased greatly if you have fibrosis or if you have smoking. So we're also always uh, concerned about that. And then there are extra pulmonary uh, causes of breathing difficulty. And I've just listed a few here, pleura, that's the lining around the lungs, which is uncommon in scleroderma, but can occur. Chest wall restriction. The scleroderma involves the chest wall so much that it's hard to take a deep breath. That can show up as abnormal uh, pulmonary function tests. Uh, deconditioning. So if you have difficulty walking or uh, joint problems of any kind, you may start slowing down. Uh, when you slow down, you then have more difficulty, your, your muscles become deconditioned, and you you're really need more, um, more cardiac output, more uh, to, to oxygenate, because you're deconditioned. It's very, very common. Uh, some of the drugs can affect breathing. Um, and, and last is depression is fairly common, and that can affect your breathing as well. So a little bit more about interstitial disease. Um, these are all my photographs that I've photoshopped or taken of Chicago. Uh, 
I do him, so, which I pull out for talks. Uh, but uh, first of all, it, it's very, very common. And if you look at patients who die with scleroderma and you look very carefully, um, you'll find that it's very common, 70 to 80 percent. I uh, spent a, a number of, uh, actually a couple of years in pathology as a, um, as a pulmonary fellow and I uh, have, a, have an appointment in pathology now. I, I look at all my tissues and I spend a great deal of time looking for little things uh, both in tissues and, in, and with my patients. And I see some of my patients here, by the way. Um, so infl inflammatory changes occur early. Uh, progression is variable. Um, they, some of you, I'm sure, have some, somebody's been told you that you have some lung disease, but here it is five or 10 or 20 years later and there's no change, which is wonderful. It seems that there's an exaggerated response to injury. And this, this TGF uh, beta is one of the common, it's a, a molecule that seems to be very tightly linked to uh, fibrosis and in many, many ways. It sets up pathways. There's a whole family of these uh, molecules and they're, they're signaling molecules that set off other things. Uh, so if you have an injury, uh, you may be more likely to go on to get fibrosis. Um, and the, path, uh, the prognosis is, is better though than interstitial disease, idiopathic, or the other kinds of fibrosis not associated with, which is, I believe, opposite uh, compared to pulmonary hypertension. If you have pulmonary hypertension, your outlook is a little worse if you have scleroderma. This is a picture of a, per, a chest x-ray with uh, scleroderma. This, so the x-ray is a beam of x-rays that goes through you. And if this would be like a negative behind. So the dark area is areas of lung that the x-ray can penetrate. The white areas like this collarbone here are where the x-ray has stopped. This is the heart. And the areas in here are on both sides are affected with fibrosis. Um, we generally, uh, imaging is very important uh, because we can see the, uh, uh, you know, get a good picture of fibrosis. But on the other hand, in general, we try, and I try at least not to get uh, CT scans uh, too often because of the radiation. Uh, this is a CT scan of a patient and you can see the bottom part, this is normal lung here. And the bottom part here has this, all of these sort of cystic changes, they call it honeycombing, which looks like honeycomb. And this is the heart. This is large uh, area right here is the esophagus. So this patient has scleroderma and has an enlarged esophagus. Some other forms of uh, lung disease, this is a picture of the alveolar ductitis. This would be here is this alveolar duct and it's filled with this scarring tissue, this early uh, um, collagen. And this responds, this part of, of uh, interstitial fibrosis responds quite well to uh, corticosteroids. So in uh, patients with the predominantly this type of disease will uh, respond and get back to normal. Uh, this is another type. These are the air spaces here. And this is the, uh, the wall. This is where the capillaries and where the oxygen is picked up. And this is loaded with these lymphocytes. Um, and this is an area, this uh, is a, an illness also that, that is responsive to uh, corticosteroids, although not nearly as good as the uh, response, uh, or as well as the response to the, the uh, alveolar ductitis. This is a person with the scarring, this lung is just all scarred. You can hardly make out the air spaces. And this area is, is tissue that is just scarred down. And although this doesn't look very pretty, it actually may stay there for years. It doesn't have the active uh, cells that are producing the, the collagen and, and causing trouble. So that's actually a, uh, a, a, I shouldn't say it's benign because that lung doesn't work very well, but it doesn't show an active process. Aspiration is another way uh, in, um, in scleroderma. Most patients with scleroderma, the lower esophageal sphincter or the, the, what closes the stomach from the esophagus is opened. 
this is very common. And despite this, um, so the material in the stomach, which would be acid, uh, can come up the esophagus and can get into the lung. Now, and I think most people with, on, with scleroderma are on acid suppressants. If you were to take an animal and anesthetize the animal, open up the lungs and the, and the stomach and put in a, a syringe and pull out some stomach acid and squirt it on the lungs. I've not done this, but if you were to do that, the lungs would sizzle and just essentially fry them. And this acid that we all have in our stomachs is uh, very, very strong. It's similar to muriatic acid, uh, pH of one, which the uh, masons use to uh, clear um, cement off of uh, tissue. Very potent. So, but most people are therefore on acid suppressants. Uh, however, you can still get um, material from the stomach up into the lungs. Um, and fortunately, we've got a, and patients with scleroderma generally have good upper airway mechanisms to prevent aspiration. So uh, we don't aspirate all the time, but it's still uh, fairly common. Uh, and this is actually one of my interests. This is uh, uh, one of the studies that we've done. We've looked at the size of the esophagus down and established a normal, and uh, we're now uh, about to publish or sending off a paper on uh, patients with scleroderma, how their CT looks. This esophagus down here has food in it. This is coming up from the, this is food at the, in the esophagus there. Well, so I just, those are sort of the number of diseases of scleroderma, and I just uh, sort of a, uh, thought in a few minutes that we have, what's new? And uh, so I just went to uh, PubMed, which is the uh, Library of Medicine's uh, catalog of, of uh, scientific articles and looked up what was going on in the last year or two and picked out a few that I thought were noteworthy. One is that there has been a new classification which, uh, uh, for scleroderma, which came out last year. And this had uh, skin thickening of the fingers extending proximal to the metacarpal Phalangeal joints was the definition now, instead of a longer definition they previously had. If this is not present, however, they had, there are seven other criteria, but uh, either pulmonary fibrosis or pulmonary hypertension were in these diagnoses and they hadn't been previously. And the basic science area, there's a lot of exciting things happening here. Uh, in fact, when I uh, crossed scleroderma with basic science, um, we uh, had uh, 770 hits, and looking down these, they're mostly really a good ideas. Now, when you say, well, is that gonna help me? It might not help you today, but as Roberto said, this is what, how we get our ideas, and there's those, that slide that Roberto had with the, all of the different pathways, some of those are, are going to lead to, to new treatments, new trials, and even more, it leads to understanding. Why do you get disease? Why does it, uh, you get fibrosis and so forth? Um, the, one of the, the key, G, key studies that I saw here was a uh, study on uh, 843 different genes where it, were expressed differently in patients with scleroderma compared to normal. And if you start looking at these genes, then you say, well, what do they do? Many of them were related to this TGF beta, many of them related to inflammation, but those are some areas where we can look for new treatments, new uh, 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 possibilities for treatment. Two areas that I've been involved with at U of I, and UIC is really a, a center in this, is, um, well, the one that I've been involved with, uh, Dr. Levitan and her colleagues are looking at endothelial cell rigidity. So they look at the cells that line blood vessels. As Roberto said, the blood vessels are are abnormal, and if these, and as you know, you have uh, increased uh, fibrosis tissue so that they become hard. So what's the effect of changing the rigidity on uh, new blood vessel formation? Uh, and we've, we've published one paper on that, we'll have an, another one coming out, and one of her uh, uh, graduate students is looking at the different pathways that are affected when you change the uh, fibrosis around that. Another one is there's a, uh, 
a, a compound called, or a chemical called caviolin-1, which Dr. Minchel uh, and a, a big group at UIC has pioneered. Uh, this is abnormal in patients with scleroderma, and uh, uh, there are actually now many papers published on this, uh, and even uh, it looks like this is, is very going to be very fruitful. As far as treatments go, there are a number of uh, new treatments. I think uh, some of the leads that uh, I've looked at interstitial lung disease are coming from the interstitial lung disease that's not associated with uh, fibrosis. These are the ones that are uh, promising. Actually, the, the Bosentan study, we were involved with that at U of I. Uh, that was stopped because it, it, uh, it was not helpful. That was interstitial lung disease. But um, you have to have failures to have successes. So uh, that doesn't bother me. This drug, uh, these are just some medications that have been used for or that are in trials for interstitial lung disease. This one, lipo, uh, lysophosphatidic acid receptor, is very interesting. These are a bunch of fatty compounds that are in the cell wall. And again, we have. Uh, UIC has one of the leading investigators in the world in this, uh, Dr. Netarajan. And s this molecule seems to s trigger fibrosis. So some of the animal models that have been looking at either blocking the molecule or blocking the receptor of the molecule to see if that can prevent fibrosis. This is not yet in anywhere close to, uh, at least as far as I know, close to human trials, however. Uh, and then we've mentioned about scleroderma mouse models. We're doing what, better with the treating our mice. Uh, transplantation, uh, Roberto's already mentioned. There, there was a study last year showing that uh, there was the same survival in uh, scleroderma as other interstitial disease. Um, and that the involvement of the esophagus, which had been uh, touted as a reason not to do lung transplant in the past, uh, seemed to n did not impact on this. Uh, CRP was a, another study showing this is a useful predictor. So in summary, scleroderma lung disease has many forms. And uh, taking clues from, your, from the history of the patient, the physical exam, the chest radiographs, and the course of disease. Uh, the question was, well, if you have pulmonary hypertension, uh, maybe I'm on the medicines. Uh, if it's, you know, do I need new medicines? Or should I change? Do I need a new... Uh, uh, a, a new, another catheterization, for example. And part of that is why you're followed by a pulmonologist, because they're looking at the whole picture and saying, okay, now you've had some stepwise decreases, we need to make some changes. Or things are going fine, we, we're not going to. Um, there is not a good set of treatment for interstitial lung disease as there is for pulmonary hypertension. Uh, but many components of this can be treated. And last, I think there's a lot of exciting research that's going on that can help us understand the basis of the disease and hopefully will lead to new uh, treatments in the future. Thank you.